Hi, this is Ace here. Um, I am at SX Studios in Bolduc in England, and we have just been profiling my amp collection from everything from Skunk and Nancy right from the beginning, from like 1994 when we started up until the present day. Uh, my original 900, which I used on all of the Skunk records and I've been using live ever since. So that's the last 20 years that amp has never left the stage or the studio. So that's uh, the main sound of, of Skunk really. Um, uh, a, a newer version of the JCM 800, a hand-wired Marshall, uh, which was personally selected. I went to the Marshall factory and I tried out all the amps and that was the head that I really liked. So <coughs> rather than buying a vintage one, I actually went to the Marshall factory and found the best sounding head in the whole factory. So that was there as well. I have a couple of Cornford amps that I really, really like. Uh, the, the, the Roadhouse 50 watt head, which is a fantastic boutique sounding amp, which is very similar to a Marshall, an old Marshall in a way. I've got the MK50, uh, which is a bit more aggressive. I suppose it sounds a little bit more like somewhere between a, a hybrid between a British amp, like a Marshall and a bit of a Mesa Boogie kind of pushed in there as well, because it's like a high gain sounding. Um, uh, we also have the Cock Power Tone, which is a really massive head, which is very similar to um, a very big kind of Fender sound, I suppose. A big tube head is 120 watt um, amp, which I use for all of my clean sounds live. So we use that head as well. Uh, looking down the list, we I brought in a really old Marshall super lead which is super 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 loud almost unusably loud in the studio which blew up the microphone with it um that's that's a, used for a kind of a good really good clean sound and, and a, if you crank it full and you link the channels it gives you that like plexi sound basically a martial plexi sound and uh, a hidden gem as well was the uh, Laney clip which i bought years and years and years ago and it's just covered in dust and it's falling apart and it's very black sabbath you know, you think of really early um, Master of Reality and those kind of albums right at the beginning, it sounds very Black Sabbath. So we've got all those as well. I'm, <coughs> I'm just going to look down my list to see if I missed anything. Okay. Um, no, that's all of it, right? But what we did do as well is we, we changed a couple of cabinets. So my main sound, when I'm on stage live and in the studio, I use the same gear, basically, because I'm one of those people, if I've got a good sound, I like it. I don't bother to say this is studio and this is live. So my main sound live is I use Marshall cabinets with vintage green backs and a, conversation, uh, a, a combination of G12s, which are like the kind of standard ones that everybody hears, which, you know, Slash uses, I think, and all those kind of people. So the G12 is more modern and, and it's a brighter sound and punchy speaker. The green backs are a more um, a, a duller and um, warmer sounding speaker, speaker. You'd, you'd kind of think of Led Zeppelin too, that kind of sound. <coughs> so I have lots of, lots of them on stage. So what I did is I went back to Marshall and I said to Marshall that um, I wanted a cabinet just small that I could take into the studio that would have a vintage green back and a G12 in the same cabinet, really good sounding, just for recording now, now that I don't have to lug all these cabs into the studio. So we used that cabinet and we got m all of the main tones that I did from that cabinet, the clean tones and all distorted ones, so absolutely fantastic. Um, we used a, a 57 on one, one uh, uh, speaker. On the other, we used uh, a Delta ribbon mic, and we also used a, what was it, Dale? 121. A 121, Roya, was Royer. it? A Roya 121 as well. Um, so we used those microphones. We had a combination of a, like a really dull sounding warm microphone and a really harsh, up front a direct microphone which was the 57 blend them together a little tiny bit of the dull one just to get a body into the 57 so that's how we get the sound of of the amps of the skunk amps is i do it by what i hear in the room so when i think this is what an amp sounds like i know the combination of microphones and where to put the microphones to make it sound like how i hear it in the room that's how i get sound i don't I'm not technical. I go, if I put the mic there and I put the mic there and I have this sound and that sound, and I blend them together, it's going to sound like my ear. So that's the way I work by the ear. So we set all those up. We did the profiles, which actually came out exactly the same after a bit of refining and all the stuff. So we had the science master Thomas here doing that. And um, then once we did that, I had a Zilla cab as well. And the Zilla cab was basically made for me on the same 
uh, context as the Marshall one. I, I didn't want to keep lugging in a giant orange cab, a vintage orange cab that I had. It was just too heavy and, you know, pain in the ass basically. So I went to Zilla and I said, can you make me a cab that sounds like an orange 4x12, but it's half the size. So they made me a specific thing, it's called a Fat Boy, and they made it with slightly thicker woods, it's a bit more dense, and they put in the original speakers, that they, I don't know what they are, the Alnico whatever things, that, that go in the original old orange 4x12s. They put two of those in there, and so basically that's like carrying around an orange cab, and the other one's like carrying a Marshall stack. And so what we did is then we profiled the same amps on the same settings, but through the Zilla cab, and it's a lot more middly, it's a lot duller, and it sounds very much like a combo or something. But what's really good about that is you can blend them. If you're tracking, you can use the, the Marshall Greenback G12 with the original profile, and then you can track it against the same uh, sound amp, but with the Zilla cabs that gives it a bottom end kind of body and a warmth that could make it kind of come really uh, massive sounding in the mix. So that's what we did. That was our profile session. It was basically all the original heads, all into the Marshall cabinet, then come back and then pick up the um, the ones that we liked and put them into the Zilla for overdubbing purposes, not the main sound. For me, um, the purpose of the Kemper is, I, you know, I, I, I love amps and I love these giant stacks and, you know, I'm quite lucky enough to have, you know, some strong roadies to pick them all up and push them around for me and put them in a truck. But um, I have a lot of gigs now, uh, where the way the business is going, where I fly in and out just for one day. And so you can't ship stuff and you can't... Um, you can't truck it in time and you get to these places like Russia or Israel or something like this and they've got very very limited hire gear and their hire gear is very um, it's old and it's outdated and it's cheap and it's falling apart and sometimes it doesn't even work so I'm at the mercy of an awful guitar sound which you know is very, it's hard work when you have to work with things like that so what I've done is I've also done direct profiles so that you can just plug the Kemper in almost as a preamp so the sounds of the amps are recorded as a preamp and then you can put them onto a power rack like a tube rack and then into your original cabinet and it basically sounds the same so I can have my amp collection I could go you know the scenario is I can jump on the plane with with the profiler I can turn up in Russia I go just give me a Marshall cabinet and I'll have a power rack with me I've got a, a cock power rack, power rack which is an ATR 45 which is absolutely fantastic and I'll just put this on my power rack, plug into the Marshall cabinet, bang, there I go, I've got my Marshall 900. Sounds the same, absolutely awesome. I don't have to use higher gear. So I can use it as a straight live amp, like on the stage, or I can go, okay, I don't want to do any of that. I don't even want to bother with the power rack. I can just go straight out the back of the Kemper. It goes straight to the PA. I can have a cabinet running off this one as well. And I can have the monitor out going to my in-ear headphones and I can have a perfect mic'd up Marshall sound instantly so I could just get on the plane with that and a guitar if I wanted to well the plan is at the moment um, I'm just in the studio with Skunk doing a track with another band like a collaboration and um, I, I was there a week or so ago and I was using the profiler um, on a preset that I downloaded from the community so I downloaded a, a good um, JCM 800 preset because I hadn't profiled my amps at that point and it was really good and I've been using that in the studio and also a Fender Twin um, to do some some demoing and um, but what what now I've got my amps profiled in there I'm in the studio um, this week I'm going to take this in and plug it in and it's going to be a lot it's going to sound a lot more authentic and it's going to be a lot easier to use and so I can start recording with that and the next step is for Skunk and Nancy is we're setting up to write the new album so the great thing is in the writing process before you know we just sit in a room with amps and we play live I can now plug this in I can have it as a cabinet playing live with the band but I can also have the output of it going into a desk so we can record anything we want at any time so all of the demoing for the next album can be used with this amp and the great thing is then if we go into the studio to record the album and we go we love that sound we had on that track all I do is basically do that and then press the button and there it is. I don't have to re-mic anything up. You know, I've got the sounds. 
um, and I just put my pedal board on the floor and I can start recording. And so <coughs> it means I'm very flexible to do the recording as well. I can do it in one studio one day, I go for a week in the next studio, I go for two days in the next studio. Whereas before, you'd have to put up everything in one place, truck it from one place to another, you know, with all the gear. So it's an incredible tool for making records, for demoing, for writing, songwriting, being able to change your amp sounds and record what you're doing at the same time. So that's really good with Skunk and Nancy. Uh, the other thing that I'm doing as well is I have a home studio and I am making backing tracks for a guitar school that I'm just starting. So I have two schools starting. I have one Ace Guitar Academy in Italy that's setting up, which I'm going to just come in and out of once every term. And I have one in London, which is setting up, which I'm there each weekend. And it's all for kids. And basically I'm recording these really simple backing tracks. But what I decided when I was making the backing tracks is I listened to other CDs that people had made in books and they all sounded rubbish. It all sounded like the cheapest, worst modeling software you could imagine, you know, with terrible programs. And I just thought, well, I'm writing a guitar course for kids to really enjoy playing guitar. And I think 90% of the time, a really great guitar sound is as important as the playing, because you only got to play one chord and it sounds great, you feel good. So I decided that when I was going to make my demos for kids to learn and play along to, I'd have authentic sounding guitar sounds. So I've used the Kemper in my studio and all the stuff sounds like I've got it mic'd up in a room with a big amp and it sounds absolutely fantastic. And that means that when the kids listen to the tracks, they'll be inspired by the sounds to learn them and play them. So it's a permanent fixture in my home studio now um, to record all my new things and, and to carry on doing backing tracks for the, for the kids so that they get inspired by really. Because I know if I was a kid and I had the backing tracks from the magazines and things I've heard, they're so terrible. I'd be like, this is really awful. Whereas if I heard the real kind of sounds, I got, that's cool. I want to sound like that. When you get your own profiles, that's what you like. So when you listen to other people's profiles, they can be great, but it's not your sound. You know, it's like your sound is what you like. So now I've got my sounds in here. It's what I like. It sounds great. It's absolutely brilliant. And I think that there was a couple of things that were really cool. Uh, the cool thing was, I've got a really old amp, this clip amp we were talking about, and um, it was breaking up. As we set it up, we said, this is not going to survive this amp. And as I was hitting it, the volume was going up and down and it was crackling. And it was like, are we going to capture this? And uh, as I played it into the thing, it was all, all breaking up. And then what the, what the, profiler did is it took the signal and it recorrected it to what it was because it took all, all the elements of the signal it profiled it and then when we played it back it came back like the amp without any malfunctioning with no volume swells crackling anything because it took all the profiles and it took the profile and it made it into a new amp so it's it actually kind of immortalized that amp because it's not going to last I don't think and uh, and, it, and it rectifies so it's usable because if, if I was in the studio and I set that amp up, it's like, we can't record with that, it's unusable now. Whereas now, it sounds like the proper thing. So I think that was really quite amazing as well. So it's quite good in that way. You know, I was saying to um, Dale here in Studio Exchange, if I was in a studio and I took my amps in and they mic'd them up and they got the sound I've got now, the Kemper, I'd be so happy, I'd be like, that's great, okay, let's go. So it means that I basically got hours of miking up gone for me, so, you know, it's brilliant, I love it. I think one of the reasons that I love the Kemper sound now with my profiles in it, I think is the fact that I've been doing this for so long. I've been playing with these amps, they, they're all marked up. We, we saw the markings on it from the last, you know, 20 years of recording and touring. So they've been proven, we've got the brilliant sounds, but we the advantage we got, I think with the profiler, it can be as only as good as the profiles you put in it. So if you download something that's been mic'd up and profiled quite badly by someone, it's going to sound quite bad. Whereas we had a bit of a dream team, we were lucky, we had a bit of a dream team going on here because when Dale set up the mics in the studio, he had a really good sound straight away. I tweaked it because I'd been in studios recording my amps for years and years, so I got exactly the sound that we needed to hear. And then we had Thomas, 
who was the genius in actually profiling it to a level where we recreated it exactly when we were raking it and doing the refining process. So between us, we had, you know, the ear, you know, we, we had the engineering expertise and we had the scientific expertise to make this kind of the profiles absolutely fast, fantastic. So I think when people hear these pro profiles, they'll actually go, wow, that really does sound like that amp, you know, in the room. So I think that if people are going to profile or they're going to download them, always remember your profile will be as good as you make it. And that's the thing. You can actually make it r almost flawless if you understand sound. You've got to understand it with the ear first and then you've got to get in the technical side after.